Good evening. I am Audrey Levine, President of Hadassah Southern California, and it is my honor to welcome all of you to the first in-person event of Hadassah Magazine's popular One Book, One Hadassah series. I want to thank all of you for joining us here at the American Jewish University campus in Los Angeles, as well as the many guests watching throughout the country on Zoom. It feels particularly important for us to come together as a Hadassah community during this difficult time for our beloved Israel, and our program this evening feels especially timely and relevant. Before we turn to our program and I introduce our speakers, I'd like to make a few announcements. When you checked in, you were given pledge, an envelope with pledge cards, index cards, and a pen. Please write down any questions you have for our speakers on the card, and people will be coming around through the pro throughout the program to collect them. Please, we ask that you pass the question cards to the end of the aisles so as to not interrupt the program. Hadassah's second solidarity mission to Israel will take place March 17th through March 22nd, and it will be led by Hadassah's own past national presidents, Rhoda Smalo and Ellen Hirschkin. We are very fortunate to have Ellen with us tonight, and you are welcome to speak to her about the mission after the program. I participated in the first Solidarity Mission delegation, and it was one of the most impactful and meaningful experiences of my life. For those of you in California, I would like to invite you to join me and the members of Hadassah Southern California for an advocacy experience this May. We will make our voices heard on issues of importance to the Jewish community at the JPAC Jewish Public Affairs Committee Advocacy Summit in Sacramento from May 14th to the 15th. It's extremely empowering. Please speak to me after the program if you're interested. Also in May, Hadassah Southern California will host our inaugur inaugural region-wide walkathon on Sunday, May 19th from 8.30 a.m. to 10.30. There will be walk locations throughout Southern California, including the Sherman Oaks Galleria here in Los Angeles. We will join together in solidarity to raise funds to rehabilitate the people of Israel. Keep an eye out for the registration website launching soon. If you are not yet a member of Hadassah, I hope you will consider joining tonight. Membership forms are in the lobby. And now without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce our esteemed guests. Ayelet Gunder Goshen is a clinical psychologist and award-winning author of four novels, the latest being The Wolf Hunt. Her first novel, One Night Markovich, won the Sapir Prize, Israel's top literary prize for debut novels as well as other awards, and has been translated into 14 languages. Her novel Waking Lions won Britain's Wingate Prize and has won a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice as well as a Wall Street Journal pick for its best summer reads list. And her novel Liar was an Editor's Choice in People magazine. Ayelet has been an editor at Yedidot Achronot, Israel's leading newspaper, and is a contributor to the BBC, Time Magazine, the Financial Times, and the Telegraph. She teaches at Tel Aviv University and the Cholon Institute of Technology. Lisa Hostein joined Hadassah Magazine in late 2015, becoming the first female executive editor in the publication's more than 100 year plus history. Before that, she was editor-in-chief of JTA, the global Jewish news agency for almost 15 years, and executive editor of Philadelphia's Jewish Exponent for Eight. She has won numerous journalism awards from the Pennsylvania Newspaper Association, the Pennsylvania chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, the Philadelphia Press Association, and the American Jewish Press Association, which also has honored her with its award for distinguished service to Jewish journalism. The organization also bestowed, near, bestowed nearly 40 Rock Hour Awards for excellence in Jewish journalism to Hadassah Magazine under her leadership. Thank you, Ayelet and Lisa, for traveling from Israel and New York, respectively, to join us and share your important perspectives. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation.
Thank you so much, Audrey. I can't say how grateful we all are to you and to your team at Hadassah Southern California who've just been amazing partners to put this program together for our special first in-person event. We really were excited about it and we couldn't have found a better team and a better location to, to partner with. So we're so thankful. I'm so delighted to be here with all of you with all of our, we had 700 people registered on Zoom because we have a loyal audience to one book, one, one Hadassah. So, you know, you're sticking with us and we appreciate that even though we're in person here, which is very exciting. So to be with you all, to be with you, Ayelet, is really special, really, really special. You know, ordinarily I would start uh, a One Book, One Hadassah program and say welcome to chapter 23 because this is the 23rd time that we've done One Book, One Hadassah. We started this program four years ago, nearly four years ago, as an opportunity for us all to be, on, all as book lovers, to be on the same page at the same time. We select a book. I part, my partner in crime is Leah Finkelstein, our senior editor and book editor. We pick a book, we publicize it, as many of you well know, I conduct an author interview, and we provide a discussion guide and really encouraging local book, group, book groups to continue the conversation. So this is 23, but it's also chapter one in our new first in-person event. So it's, as Audrey said, it's so important to come together in community, especially these days, day 139 of the war, where we so much really, really need to be together. I just want to um, remind you that there are cards and pencils under your chair. If you do have questions, please do fill them out as the program goes along and pass them to the end of the row. Um, for those of you on Zoom, unfortunately there's no Q&A for you, but I'm sure the questions here will be good and the ones that you think of as well. So Ayelet, a really, really warm welcome. We are so grateful that you made your way here from Tel Aviv. We planned this program starting about seven or eight months ago. And we wanted to find a strong female author out of Israel. We only, as most of you know, do only female authors. And we were looking for somebody out of Israel. And we just, uh, it just still boggles the mind that we picked your book that would be so relevant today. And we're gonna certainly get into a conversation about all that. But I wanna ask you, I wanna start by asking you, I think this is the first time that you've left the country since October 7th. So how hard was that to leave your family and your work? Um, that's a hard question. I will start by saying uh, shalom and that I'm very excited and honored to be here. <laughs> um, it was very difficult for me to, to, leave, uh, to leave Israel. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist at a mental health hospital. Uh, at Shalvata Mental Health Hospital, and we had a state of emergency uh, called after immediately after October 7th because the hospital was called to give uh, first, uh, first aid, first mental aid to survivors uh, of the massacre and to people who were evacuated from the south. Uh, so to leave the hospital, to leave my work, and also I have three little kids. Um, I never traveled away from Israel at the time of war, and I never experienced this, this sort of a war. And I just hope that everything will be will be quiet until I get back to to my my own babies and and to my patients. And uh, it's it's just so strange. To I walked today to Santa Monica in the morning, uh, early in the morning because of the jet lag. And you see people on the beach and, and life seems so normal and it feels so surreal. Uh, talking on the phone with people back home and being here in Santa Monica, it just felt like such a gap. I didn't know how to process it. And then when I came here and, and I met people here wearing the etadiskit, the, the necklace, and suddenly it felt okay. It, the gap wasn't so big as it was this morning in Santa Monica. I, it felt a bit closer to home, even though it's a, it's a 15 hour flight. Yeah, we've definitely been feeling it very strongly here as you have and I have talked about. How old are your children? How have they been dealing with this? I have a nine year old girl, a seven year old boy and a two year old baby. Mm -hmm. And we keep saying that everyone is jealous of the baby right now because he's the only one who is uh, completely clueless about, about what's going on. Um, 
With the kids, it, it's been a very challenging uh, time, I, I think, to go through these questions of what are we going to tell them, how much should we expose them. It's interesting because I always thought about when my daughter was born, and I held her when she was just a newborn, and I thought, I wonder how long it will be before she will realize that because she happened to be born a girl and not a boy, that life is going to be different for her. How long is it going to be before she realizes that when she goes in the street at night, it's a different experience than when a, when a baby boy who grows up to be a boy goes to the street at night. And now I start to think about it also about her Jewish identity. I wonder how long will it be before my kids will learn what Jewish, what being Jewish truly means because so far it meant, I think because they grew up in Israel, being Jewish was just a neutral, it's like the air you breathe, everyone is Jewish. And I'm thinking at which age they would be old enough to, to know everything that's going on. I mean, we don't let them watch violent TV, we don't let them watch Batman or Spider-Man because that's considered too, too violent. In which age can they watch the news? I, I really don't know. Yeah, so hard, so hard indeed. As I said at the beginning, the, your book, I mean, we're gonna get, we're gonna weave in the book and, and experience because they're, they're very much related right now. And the book, you know, I just, I reread it. I had read it months ago when we decided to choose it. And then I read it again the last couple of weeks to refresh my memory, which is not very good. So I, but just was so uncan uncanny, there were like lines toward the beginning where the Israeli nephew, after an anti-Semitic attack, says to uh, his cousin, well, there would never be a terrorist attack like that in Israel. Um, or, or somebody saying, uh, anti-Semitic is just the beginning, the attack on the synagogue. But I, I do want you to first, give a little synopsis of the book, because I'm sure many people here have read it, and I'm sure many others may be in the middle of it, and many more will be reading it after this program. So give a little synopsis of what the book is about. Um, the Wolf Hunt tells the story of an Israeli family relocating to America. The husband is working in tech, and the mother, Lilach, the protagonist, she wants to get away from Israel because she wants to raise her child in a place where there is no war, when you don't have to search for the emergency exit in case of a, of a terror attack, the way I was taught by my mother at, when, when I was a little girl. She wants to raise her child away from the Israeli madness. But then when the terror attack happens at the local synagogue at the Silicon Valley, she starts to feel that maybe she took her child out of the Israeli madness only to expose him to the American sort of madness so that it's not the terror attacks of Israel, but there is the anti-Semitism and the fact that he is identified as, as the Jew or as the other. And then she sends her child to study Krav Maga, to learn self-defense, because after the terror attack, she doesn't want him to, to ever be a victim. And later on, when another child from his class dies at a, at a class party, and it's a black Muslim kid, people start to say that perhaps her own child was part of that. And so she starts to ask herself, could it be that she was so passionate about keeping her child safe that she unintentionally pushed him into, because she didn't want him to be a victim, she turned him into being a victimizer. And she starts to ask myself, how much do I really know my own child? How much do I really know what my child is capable of? It is like a sort of, of a mystery uh, thriller, but I think that the mystery she's trying to solve is, is her own child. Mm. And it's a psychological thriller for sure. So where did you get the story idea from? I think The Wolf Hunt is the only novel that I can actually give you the exact date. It, ha it has a birthday on the calendar. And the reason is because I got the idea on the first day of school uh, in the Israeli school year, which is uh, September 1st. And I took my little girl for her first day at preschool. And she was four years old back then. And when we walked in the street in Tel Aviv, I realized that I was holding her hand and I was supposed to be the grown-up, but I was shaking and she was walking quite okay. 
And then when we entered the preschool, I realized that I was looking at all the other kids in this suspicious look, like scanning their faces, trying, looking at all the little girls and all the little boys and wondering which one of the little girls here might say nasty, something nasty to my daughter the moment I leave the room. And they're all such sweet little girls like this high and I'm looking and they're like, which one of you is going to say something or do something to my little daughter, to my little angel? Or I was looking at the boys and they're sweet little boys and I was really, which, which one of you here is the bully? I'm going to catch you and I'm going to do something. And then when I was about to leave, I realized that I wasn't the only one. I realized that all the mothers and all the fathers had the same look. They were scanning my kid, I was scanning their kids. We were all trying to identify where is the bully, where is the wolf, where is the bad animal in this jungle disguised as a, as a classroom that, that might try to harm our, our little cub. And then when I came out, I thought, wait a minute, how come we're all looking for the wolf and none of us is considering the possibility that maybe my child is in fact that girl. That maybe my daughter is right now saying something nasty to somebody else's daughter in order to feel good about herself or, or you know, to... And this was a very disturbing uh, question. And as I walked home from the preschool, I asked myself, can I be sure? Because I want to say, yeah, I know my daughter, but it, I thought, what? Do I? And I also thought, do I want to know for certain what, what is she capable of when I'm not there? And, and then as I came back home, I told this to, to my partner and I asked him, I said, say you have a choice. In life we don't get this choice, but say you had the choice. Between our daughter right now at the preschool being bullied by another girl, but she knows that she's a good person and she knows that she's not harming anyone else and that she's good from within. Or say you could choose that she's right now the bully. So she's confident and she's strong, but she's stepping over somebody else to, to get to her high status. What would you rather have her? I'm, I'm asking you, what would you rather have for, for your children? And and I thought it was an interesting question. And he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and he was so upset with this question. And he told me, I'll say it in Hebrew and I'll translate. He said, Tegidi, esamin imaat. Which is Hebrew for what kind of mother are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why? I mean, we have two hours to kill before we can go and rescue her from, from the first day. We have to talk about something. It's better than checking the news. And he said, what kind of mother even asks this question? Of course I prefer, and this is a typical Israeli man. So he said, of course I prefer my child to be the bully mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than the victim. And, and I said, why is it so obvious? And he said, this is such, he said in Hebrew, zot kazot she'ela smolanit, which is in English something like, this is such a woke question. Of course I prefer to be the bully, because a bully, you can educate a bully. You can take it out of her. But if she's a victim, then she will carry the scars for life. And, and then I, I was upset by what he said about me being the, the woke, so I pulled out the, the psychologist card on him. <laughs> and I said, you're only saying that because your grandfather was a Holocaust survivor, because you have the third generation syndrome. So you automatically see everywhere as a battlefield. And, and you would prefer our four-year-old in Tel Aviv and everything is fine, but still to never be a victim again. And this is how you raise a generation after generation of, of people who are so afraid of being a victim that they become aggressors. And this was one of the reasons why I couldn't open the wolf hunt after October 7th, because I, I recalled this discussion, this, 
debate that we had. And I felt like I, I, can't, I can't read it right now the way, the way I wrote it. I, I want to be the person who is capable of having that conversation and, and I'm not sure when I will be able to. But this was the moment back then that I knew that it's going to be a novel. When I walked back to the preschool to pick her up, I thought how this experience I had as a mother asking how much do I know my own daughter in a split of a second became from the psychological question of a mother-daughter to this question of Israeli identity, of Jewish identity, of trauma. And I felt if this was enough to get both of us so passionate about when, when we were waiting in the Tel Aviv apartment, then this is something that I have to write the novel about. That was the moment it started. That is just so fascinating. So a couple of questions come to my mind is, why didn't I have those questions when I dropped my boys off at preschool? So I'm wondering, is it a girl boy thing? Like, do you worry that about that more with a girl? Although you said that you saw it in you know the, the faces of the parents of boys as well. Is it an Israeli thing? Which is your kind of what you're explaining a little bit with that mentality? Um, is it because you're a psychologist? You know, so you think these things because I'm I'm wondering like why didn't I have those questions? I had other questions like you know did he like those toys that were there, or you know, who are going to be the other friends, but there were different questions. So it's so interesting that this is what occurred to you, and I guess your husband also like, wondered you know, why that was so. So do you have any sense of why, why those questions occurred to you? I kind of feel like the psychologist piece is a big piece of it. It's a good question. It could be that I'm just far more neurotic than you are. <laughs> I don't know, we could have a good competition. I, I think it's interesting because when, when The Wolf Hunt was published in, in other languages, it was interesting to see in which territories people um, feel very much relating to this question and where it wasn't so much. So when I was in, in Germany, for instance, then they all talked about, and I met uh, German readers read it in the German translation, they were very much obsessed with the possibility of raising a bully, but they were completely different in their perspective about what would a parent rather have. Because in Israel, when I met readers, all Israeli men said that it wasn't a question and that they would prefer to raise the, the strong bully rather than the victim. When I was in Germany, I got completely different answers. Mm -hmm. And then I was... I told it to a friend of mine and, and I asked her if he thinks it has something to do with, with our joint history. That in Israel, people would never want to raise a victim and that in Germany they are so afraid of raising the aggressor. And, and my friend said, well, that's one option. The other option is that it's a crowd of German audience sitting in front of a Jewish Israeli author. What did you think <laughs> they are going to tell you? <laughs> So interesting, but I mean that that different uh, different take and understanding in different countries that is really interesting. That's something you can pursue, you know, psychologically too, right? But I, I want to go back to something else that you just said about being able to having a hard time looking at the story again because it's just so you know relevant. But I was wondering how you are looking at it and how you might have written it a little differently, or the characters might have been a little different, um, whether you would have been able to write that book given what's gone on. That's a good question. There's a sentence in the novel that uh, I remember my mother hated, and she told me, I know it's just fiction, but I still hate the sentence. Um, and I knew she's going to hate the sentence when, when I wrote it. Um, there's a moment when Lilach, the protagonist, she talks about how she chose to leave Israel. And she says that she didn't leave Israel because she didn't love it. She says that she loved Israel very much. She loved it the way a beaten woman loves her beating husband, oh. but leaves him because she knows that she has to do it to keep the kids safe. And as I wrote it, I felt uncomfortable writing it because I do raise my kids in Israel. I'm different from my protagonist. But it was a very important sentence that I felt has to be written in order to understand Lilach's character. 
And then after October 7th, people reminded me of that sentence. I got emails from readers quoting that sentence. And, and this is something asking me, so, so is this the, the beating? And, and this is something that was, for me, very, very difficult to, to reread. I think many things in the novel that felt like you're exploring in fiction suddenly became real life. I, had an, um, I flew in through New York and I had an event in Colombia. And some students in Colombia told me things that I, I was shocked to, to hear. And, and I'm, I'm not usually shocked so, so easily. Um, I think this- Shocked is about what was happening to them on campus or what were you shocked about? What was happening on campus? What was happening inside faculty, between faculty members, um, between people I thought as, as allies, um, about how one can see somebody else suffering and be completely indifferent to it. And, and I thought, I mean, this is something that was beyond my imagination. I think this is one of the reasons why I hadn't come back to writing since October 7th. That I just feel that reality right now is, is so twisted that imagination seems impossible to... Like, how can you write something in a world which is so much beyond words? Mm -hmm. yeah. You've talked a little bit about Lilach, the, the protagonist, the mother, and you know, clearly I think it's a question probably all of us have, like how, you know, how could she suspect her son in, in, this, uh, in this murder or death or we didn't really know exactly. Um, was she a difficult character to write for you? Very much. First of all, because she writes in a first person uh, perspective. So the novel is written through her eyes. And it's difficult because when you write in a first-person perspective, people often confuse between you and your character. Uh, so they automatically assume that I am Lilach. And the more I say that I'm not, the more they assume that I am. Um, so I think this was difficult for me. And also I think something in the position of the mother of a teenager, because she's really looking at her son, at Adam, like this riddle that she's trying to solve. Like she becomes, she's forced to become a bit of a police detective. But I thought that maybe every mother of a teenager feels sometime as if she was a bit of a police detective. That every mother sometimes feels like she has to search for clues, you know, that, I mean, I don't know how is it in America, but in Israel, when you ask your kid how was school, they usually come back in a, either two words if you're really lucky, one word if you're not. <laughs> and then you feel like you have to take this answer and you know, put it through this scanning, right? right? Like x-ray to, to see what's hidden inside. And there, I wanted the reader to ask himself, is she paranoid? Could it be that it's so difficult for her to be so distant from her own child that she's imagining things? Or could it be that she's actually sensing something very disturbing and, and trying to find out who her child really is? And I find it, you know, as a mother, I have this two-year-old boy. And right now, when something hurts, when he falls down, the first thing he does is he runs to me to show it to me. He comes and he shows me his elbow. He comes and he shows me his knees. And I'm thinking, in 10 years from now, I will be the last person to know because when really, when he will be bleeding not from the knees but from within his heart, I will be the last person to know. And right now, I know everything. The idea that somebody that I carried inside my own body will be so far away from me. I think these are the moments when Lilach and I are very much the same. I think also because of the, the shift in the mother's role between, as a mother of a young child, you're like the son of the house. You enter the house and he runs to, when I come back from the mental health hospital, I, I call it the second shift because I come into the house 
and and he's running to me and he's walking after me and I want to check the news to see what's going on and he's Ima, 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 Ima. And right now I'm the center of his universe. But if I will come back 15 years from now, then he will walk into the house and I will run to him. <laughs> And I will say, how, and he will be on the phone and not bother to answer me. And I will be, become from the queen of the house to be like this beggar, <laughs> you know? Really, like, can you spare a few coins of attention? <laughs> and this shift is so heartbreaking that when I wrote Lilach, I thought this is a woman that is so shaken by this shift from being the center of his universe to, to being a beggar that this is, it makes her a, a little bit crazy. And to write a character who takes your biggest fears, but writes them in caps lock, it's, it's a very disturbing experience. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that you document so well what that experience is gonna be with teenagers when you don't even have teenagers yet. So <laughs> I'm not sure whether you're gonna be in for a shock that is, that is even worse. So guess what, I actually have a 22 year old son. He happens to be here tonight and I say, what, what happened? What happened today? Stuff. What'd you do today? Stuff. I still get that. So it continues. There's no question. I 100% hear what you're saying there about not being the center of the universe anymore. I want to shift gears a little bit. First of all, I want to remind you that if you have questions, and I also want to just say that I don't have any clock up here. So Leah, I'm going to ask you to like keep time for when it's time for you to bring questions up to me. Sure. Thank you. Let's shift the whole notion of Israelis living in America. Again, I think just so fascinating in your book and also just, you know, what's been going on in Israel even pre-October 7th. I think for Israelis living in America, it's always been an issue of multiple identities, trying to figure out, you know, whether you should be here, whether you should be staying here. I think we know that kind of that phenomenon that has existed for a while. And there are, I don't even know what the numbers are, of hundreds of thousands of Israelis living in America. So I'm curious why that was your focus. I know you spent a year, I think, in San Francisco, at San Francisco State University. And so you were here for a year, but yet this is where you wanted to set this novel, and this was the community that you wanted to focus on. So how did that come about, and did you feel that you really like understood it? I think it's very interesting being Israeli and arriving in America, because in a way, I've been to America long before I first set foot in America. I think every Israeli teenager can describe certain uh, places in America, uh, the skyline of New York, better than the skyline of Netanya, even though I live 20 minutes away from Netanya, Tel Aviv to Netanya. Um, I think most people in Israel can describe Venice Beach better than they can describe Chof Al Machim. Um, because we grew up on this. And on television, is that what you mean by like television shows and things you, like that? You were nurtured uh, with, with the American dream, even though you live, you know, on the other side of, of the globe so much that when we say, people don't say la sotava, making love in Hebrew. They call it sex, which is the English word. People use English word inside Hebrew so much that, you know, the wolf hunt in Hebrew, the title, is relocation, the English word relocation written in Hebrew letters. It's not a wolf hunt, it's relocation written in Hebrew letters. And my mother, who was um, a literature teacher, was very upset by that too. And she said, this is why Eliezer ben Yehuda reinvented Hebrew language, so that you will call a book written in Hebrew in, in an American, in an English word. And I said, it's not an English word. Relocation, it's a Hebrew word. Because in Israel right now, many people are talking about relocation. It came in English as is and landed inside Hebrew so that the word carries associations of living the American dream. When you want to say he's living the American dream in Hebrew, what you say is a who saw relocation. He did relocation. You use the English word relocation. And location, that's what you're saying, that it's like location? That relocation. Relocation, okay, relocation. I'm saying it was the Hebrew right. accent. Right, Relocation. <laughs> and then I got my final proof to, to what I told to my mother because when it was translated to, to English, 
I got an email from my American editor saying, we love the title very much. Will you be uh, willing to consider a different title in English? Because uh, relocation doesn't carry any meaning to the American audience. Yeah. It carries meaning only to the Israeli audience, yeah. which was fascinating also because of the cultural differences. It took me two days to realize that when an American writes, we loved the title, will you be willing to consider a different title? <laughs> She's actually saying, you have to change the title. <laughs> And, and these are the cultural differences. This is exactly why I set the, the novel in America, because I wanted my protagonist to, to pay the price of being the outsider. And when I came to San Francisco, I realized I thought I speak English, and I thought it would be OK because I speak English, but I don't speak American. <laughs> and it, it, these are two different languages. I will give you an example. Um, in Hebrew, we don't have an equivalent to small talk. There is no, you can't translate small talk to Hebrew, it doesn't exist in Hebrew. The concept doesn't exist and the word doesn't exist. There is no such thing as small talk. It's, hi, nice to meet you, how much do you earn for a month? <laughs> this is how we... <laughs> but also, the word tact, 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 right? Be, being tactful. Yeah. There is no Hebrew word. <laughs> this is not a joke, really. I'm, I'm not kidding. You can you can Google it. There is no translation to Hebrew for tact. Because Israelis don't have any. Because we, we don't need that. it. <laughs> but but yeah, the other one too, because the Hebrew word being dugri. Okay, the Hebrew word dugri cannot be translated into English. You can say in your face, but in your face means something, I think it has a, a negative association, mm -hmm. like being rude. Mm -hmm. But being dugri is very valued, almost as valued in Israel as being tactful is valued mm -hmm. here. Or even the Yiddish word chutzpah, <laughs> which landed very, like, it has a green card now, <laughs> but, but it's in Yiddish. It was never translated to English. And I think for, for me, these cultural differences are exactly what Lilach, my protagonist, is, is struggling with. And she will always remain the outsider. And she was willing to stay the outsider to create a different existence to her child so that she will be like the bridge that she crosses over to the new land. Mm. And she calls him Adam, and I thought about Adam and, and the Garden of Eden and, and the idea of, of starting something new. And I think this is why the terror attack shakes her so badly, because she realizes that even though her child is, is an American kid, he still can feel sometimes like an outsider. This is what I heard from some of the Jewish students in Colombia, that they find themselves feeling like like the Jew, and they never thought that, that they would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things have definitely changed a lot in, in that way for a lot of kids and, and adults as well. However, you, you know, the, I'm just so fascinated by the focus on Israelis living in America. I mean, I'm wondering what kind of reaction you've gotten from Israeli friends or Israelis that you know who live in America. Is it, was it chutzpah for you to write about that, given that you spent you know, a year here? Did you really feel like you understood what that experience is? I mean, it seems like you really master it, because that whole notion of feeling you, know, you, you should be there when you're here or here when you're there, and that tie that just never really breaks and the, the guilt that I think a lot of Israelis feel. But what, what has been the reaction among Israelis here? I got a lot of reactions from people writing, um, saying that they feel like Lilach. Um, one of the professors I met at Columbia s said it j just two days ago. Um, I didn't get the reaction of how dare you write this, you've only been here one year, because I think I think in that maybe Israeli culture is different than America because this, this idea that you cannot write about something if you're not, if you don't belong to that race or to that color or to that gender, it's not, 
so much part of, of the Israeli cultural scene, and, and I'm very happy about it because I think one of the things I like about literature is the idea that you can read a novel and identify and cry for a character that was born 200 years before you were born or that lives in a country that you never visited or that has a different skin color or a different gender. And I think this is the humanistic act of reading, that reading forces you to get out of your own skin and you know step into sh the shoes of the other. And I think this is so beautiful. And I think that the idea that in order to write something, you have to be that person as if one cannot uh, imagine what it is to be like a man can't write from the perspective of a woman or a Jew can't write from the perspective of a non-Jew or the other way around. I feel this is the, the opposite of humanism. This is the idea that, our, that we are completely marginalized inside our identity and that we cannot take the sleep of, of faith and empathy. Right. No, I 100% agree with you. I mean, I think that this notion that appropriation, that you can't write about something that you don't know or have an experience directly, I 100% agree with you. I meant more, um, not so that you didn't really have the right to do it, but just really, and I mean, again, it really seems like you understood like what it is that Israelis are experiencing here. And it just seems interesting having been here for a year. Because again, it's not just writing about another experience and making it up. Like when you get it right, <laughs> that's why I was curious to know what Israelis felt. But it sounds like, it sounds like you did. <laughs> I hope, though, you know, it's a, one of the nice things in Israel is that you always have you meet people that come and tell you, I love the book and this, this, until this page, but from here on, you got it completely wrong. <laughs> so I guess. Somebody will probably say it about right, it, right. one more than another. Right. Well, you know, let, that's actually a good segue to, to one of your, I mean, a lot of really interesting characters in the book, but Uri is clearly one of the very interesting main characters. Um, you know, he's, he's a complex character, as a lot of characters are in your book. So where did he come from? And, and how um, difficult was it to figure out where he was going in the story, because he certainly takes a lot of twists and turns. So I'll say for those of you who haven't read the novel that Uri is the Krav Maga instructor. He is the, the man that starts to teach the, the Jewish and the Israeli kids uh, self-defense after the terror attack. And he's the man that Lilach starts to suspect that might have encouraged her child into um, a hate crime as a revenge against uh, what happened in the terror attack. And Uri is based on this very prototype of the, the Zionist macho man, the one who says in Hebrew, if somebody is coming to kill him, you, you better kill him first. Um, and there is something aggressive about him, but there is also something very appealing about him. So much that Adam, Lilach's child, uh, is very drawn to him. And Lilach is also gradually becoming very drawn to him. And, and I think there is something about this sort of masculinity which I find to be very interesting because on the one hand, Lilach is ironic to it. I can be sometimes ironic to it as a woman. But on the other hand, when things go wrong, Lilach automatically turns to this sort of, of masculinity. And I was interested in Uri's character because, you know, in, in Israel, in the economic papers, they always write about the people who, who made it in America. They write about the, the tech giants, they write about the unicorns, uh, about the exits. And I was wonder, what about all the other guys? What about all the guys that, that came to America but didn't make it in America? What about them? Where, where do they write about them? And it's not in the economic papers, so I, I've, written, I've written Uri as one of those guys. He's someone who, he was an ex-commando unit, uh, he was a commander, and he was very successful at the commando unit, and then he was released from the army, and he was, cons like everyone expected him to be this very successful businessman, and he's not. He's teaching Krav Maga. Uh, in the Silicon Valley, for the, he's teaching the kids of very successful businessmen. And I thought, what happens to someone 
who was promised everything and got nothing? And how dangerous can this make him be? Um, and I was very, very curious by this character. I was a bit afraid of his character, but I was also very much attracted to this character. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I want to shift gears a little bit. Well, well I, have a, I have a lot more questions, but I'm going to get to the audience questions too. I'm sure there are a lot of ones. Thank you so much. The top one was the most. OK, great. The most, the most asked. But before we, we shift to these, you're a psychologist. You talked about how you're working in trauma. So I'm really, I mean, the statistics keep coming out. Even just yesterday, Tel Aviv University said that Israel will have 30,000 you know, new PTSD patients from the war. I've read 23 to 30% of Israelis are experiencing some sort of trauma already. So I want you to talk a little bit about both the individual and collective trauma that you are, you know, directly dealing with. And I'm curious to know, like, how it's different than trauma that you've dealt with in the past and whether the treatment is different given what the situation is. It's completely different than everything we dealt in the past because the first thing you learn and the first thing you usually do with people uh, after a traumatic event is that you say, it's over, you're safe now. I'm here with you, it's over, you're safe now. And when we came to Eilat, Eilat, it's the, the city in the southern point of, of Israel, and this is where the people were evacuated immediately after the massacre, and we, you meet people immediately after the massacre, and you can't say that, and that's the first sentence you say to, to a survivor. You can't say that because half, I've been working with kibbutz near Oz, and half of the kibbutz were, were either, back then were either considered missing or taken to Gaza. So how can you say, it's over, you're safe now? It's not over, and none, nobody feels safe. Um, so it was completely different. Um, you could sense the, 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 the collective trauma. Another thing I remember from Eilat, uh, there's this shopping mall in Eilat, and in one of the days, there was uh, people would go out and, and try to, to relax a bit, and then there was a balloon that popped, uh, and people fainted, ran, screamed, and it was just a balloon. And this was the moment when I said, okay, th this is going to take years to recover, years. Mm -hmm. Because the reaction was, was such a reaction of, of shock and it was so good that nobody had a gun at that moment. And when Ben Gvir is talking about giving guns to everyone, I think he doesn't realize that when you take an entire nation suffering from PTSD and you give everyone a gun, it, it can be very dangerous. And I will say something about, about treatment that I, I can share this, this one case because it's a, it's a patient that, that agreed uh, to, to share the, her story because I think it's a very important story. I had this one patient that was evacuated from the south and, and she didn't leave her house for a long time after that, for um, about a month and a half after she, she was moved to, to the center. She didn't leave the house because she was afraid of, of the terrorists coming back and she would sit next to the window and, and just watch. And people brought her food so that she wouldn't have to leave the house, which is a mistake that p many people make, that you want to help someone and because you want to help you, you turn this someone into a baby and, and you come like the superhero, so you feel very empowered by being the superhero, mm -hmm. but you're missing the point that you're turning this, if you're the superhero and she's the baby, then she can't recover. And then we talked about how she has to be able to leave the house. And I asked her, what did you do before, before October 7th? Um, and she said that she really liked listening to Taylor Swift and, and like going jogging and listening to Taylor Swift. And then I said, Okay, so, so why don't you do it today? And she looked at me and, and she said, we had back then was 200 people hostage in Gaza right now. And you're telling me to take a walk in the park and listen to Taylor Swift? What, what kind of therapist are you? 
And this was such a crucial moment because this was like the, the guilt, the survivor's guilt, which is like a poisoned arrow because this woman, she came to therapy because she realized she has a problem and she wanted to get better and for her kid's sake, for her kids, she had to be able to leave the house. But at the same time that part of her wanted to come to therapy, there was a part of her that felt that if she will get better, she's betraying the memory of the hostages as if, if she will feel a bit of happiness again. Mm -hmm. This is like um, giving up or, or not caring enough mm -hmm. about the people in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And it's such a, a dangerous notion for our economy because our economy will not survive if we will not go to restaurants in Tel Aviv. And how can you go and enjoy a, a good dinner right now? You can't. But I go once a week, no matter what. I finish a shift in the hospital and all the team in the clinic, I insist on it. We all go as a team and we drink margaritas, not because we want to dance on the tables like we might have done before in Tel Aviv, <laughs> but because we have to keep economy going. And this patient, the idea that yes, you have to go to a walk on the park and listen to Taylor Swift. And in fact, this is a sort of activism because when you reassume life, the only people that don't want you to enjoy life, it's not the hostages. The only people that don't want you to be able to go back to life, it's, it's Hamas because they want you to be, this is the impact of a terror attack. Mm -hmm that the terror remains and that even the people who are not directly affected, they condemn themselves to this mental cell. Because if you're at home in Tel Aviv and you don't go out because you feel guilty to go out, then you put yourself in, in a cell, you lock yourself up as if you were taken hostage. And I think this is exactly yeah. what Hamas wants. Yeah. So I feel therapy right now is crucial not just for the symptoms of, of PTSD, for nightmares, for intrusive memories, for people who are not leaving the house, but also for survivor's guilt, which is something I think we all experience as, as a society right now. Yeah. I wonder, it's interesting what you said about the activism, both from individuals who are experiencing PTSD, but also the you know, the large amount in the country, like the activism that people have just immediately gone out to you know, help people, bring food, educate. I mean, we hear these stories all the time about how Israelis have just been doing that, and Americans too, and Israel, you know, Americans going over and helping. Um, you know, one issue that I think clearly troubles us all among the many issues is the, the issue of the rape and torture of women, right? You're closing your eyes, it's so painful to even talk about even just yesterday, the Association of Rape Crisis Centers in Israel submitted to the United Nations a more detailed report suggesting that everything that we already thought we knew and documented was less than really happened. And um, Hadassah, as you may know, just launched a big campaign and the silence to uh, get people to sign a petition to demand that the UN conduct an investigation. And so again, we often feel helpless here, but that's something we can certainly do, which I think is so important. But I'm curious, have you treated anybody who dealt directly with some of that? I mean, again, we know that a lot of the victims are no longer alive, but in terms of women who were experiencing that, you know, horrific among the horrific, Crimes. I won't, I can't answer specifically because, you know, this is... Right, you have to respect privacy for sure. Okay, okay, okay. But, but I can say one thing, and, and this comes back to, to something very crucial, I think, with trauma, collective trauma and individual trauma. It's not just the event itself. It's also the question of empathy and solidarity and people's willingness of being witnesses of being compassionate witnesses. Because I think, you know, when a child falls down, the first thing he does before he attends the wound is to look up and to see, to look for the eyes of the grown up. To, like, did you see this? Did you see what happened to me? Can you please mirror back to me the, the eyes of the mother of saying, yeah, I saw this and this is painful and this is terrible. And, and just like a child needs to see the face of the mother and the fact that the mother acknowledges that he fell down, every victim 
of a terror attack and of a sexual attack needs to see, needs to know that people validate and that people are willing to bear witness to what happened. Mm. And October 7th is just the beginning. The fact that after October 7th, people refused to acknowledge the sexual assault. People are still saying that it's faked or that the numbers are lower, but, but at the time that we as mental health professional know the, the real numbers. This is, I mean, October 7th is a trauma, but the world's reaction is another trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and by that I think that the fact, the solidarity of the Jewish community outside of Israel and the fact that people insisting that yes, this did happen is so crucial, not just for the, the outside world. I don't care about the UN. It's crucial for, for us, for Israelis, to read about it and to know about it, that, that people do see it, that people do care. Right, right, absolutely. So I think this is probably the most asked question, and I had it, and everybody I know who read the book had it. Why did you decide to think it was important to leave the question of who the killer was ambiguous? And again, we're not spoilers here, but we're, you know. I'll give you an answer, but it's gonna be a long one. <laughs> For me, the answer lies in, in the question of what is the, the real mystery of this novel for me, and what is it that I wanted to solve? Whether Adam, Lilach's child, killed Uri, or does Lilach, does the mother, really want to know? If it, not Uri, I'm sorry, killed Jamal. Does Lilach, does the mother really want to know the answer? What is she more concerned about? protecting her, her child at all cases, or protecting the world in case her child did the wrong thing. And I was very curious about it because when I thought about detective stories, and I wanted to be a bit of a detective story, and I thought about the first detective, the first literary detective being King Oedipus. So I would argue that long before Sherlock Holmes, King Oedipus is the first detective because if you remember, there's the plague on the city and Oedipus is the king and the oracle tells him that if he wants to stop the plague, he has to find who killed the previous king. So Oedipus launches an investigation, like a good detective. He, he has witnesses and he launches this investigation and he assumes that the killer is out there that the aggressor is out there, that the wolf is out there, just like I assumed as a mother that the potential aggressor in the class is somebody else, but definitely not my daughter. So King Oedipus is a detective and he's certain that the, the evil has nothing to do with him and that it's somebody else roaming the streets of Tebai. But by the end of the play, and that's a spoiler, Oedipus finds out that it wasn't somebody out there who was capable of killing, that it was he himself who killed the former king. And that's the moment when he stops looking for the truth and when he takes out his eyes. And I think it's interesting because he wanted to see the truth, but at the end of the play, he takes out his eyes. And I thought about this mother that wants to know everything about her child. And she's a detective like Oedipus that assumes that the evil is out there that the evil is Uri, that the evil is Jamal, that somebody else is, is responsible. And I thought, how much does this mother willing to acknowledge not the potential aggressiveness of her own child? Because I think the real question is, is the mother willing to look away if she did find out that her child is a killer? And if she is, what does it say about her moral character? Not about Adam. So for me, in a way, this whole investigation wasn't really about Adam. I have an answer of was Adam involved or not. But for me, the real question was, what would you do if a mother, as a mother if you find out? Would you hand over your child because you care about the truth and you care about morals? Or would you protect him at every cost because the only thing sacred is your own child. And for me, that was the biggest dilemma. And I think this dilemma, I hope, 
this dilemma is solved in the end of the novel. Hmm. That's so fascinating, again, psychological thriller for sure. And so you're basically saying you have the answer, you're just not gonna tell us. <laughs> okay, that's fine, we'll have to, maybe there'll be a sequel. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to discuss it over dessert. Okay. <laughs> You don't get the answer, only I get it later. Over a drink, maybe. So another question from the audience. So the family in the book is criticized by their family back in Israel for making Yerida. We talked about this a little bit, about you know the idea that uh, Israelis would leave Israel and come to live in America or elsewhere. So do you think that the, I mean, this is an issue that people are talking a lot about in Israel now, because, you know, again, this notion that Israelis might be wanting to leave because they don't feel safe anymore. Do you think it's more of an issue than, than it's been in the past? There's been a huge shift um, between the generations. So that a generation ago, the word for um, leaving Israel was l'redet, yerida, yordim. Yerida in Hebrew means going down. If you left Israel, the, the, literally, Yerida meant you went down from Israel. And if you would go to Israel, you would make Aliyah. Aliyah means going up. Now, geographically, we all know that you're not going down when you're leaving Israel or going up when you're moving to Israel. But this was the word. Today, nobody says Yordim. Nobody says going down. Today we say, la sot relocation, mm. okay? Mm. And this is the shift. Mm. And I think this is history's irony that after 2,000 years of longing to the promised land and praying with the face to the east, for many Israelis today, the ultimate Israeli dream is to live the American dream. And in a way, people are praying today with their face to the west. And I think about, you know, my grandfather fought in the war of 48. And I remember in the, in the Gulf War, he was so upset. We were sitting there with the gas masks and he was roaming in, in the room like, you know, like a tiger, as if he, he was scratching the walls. And he said, and I didn't understand it back then because I was a child, but I understand it now, he said, to go through the war of 48 to my, I'm named after my uncle Eyal and he was killed in the 73 war. Yeah. So he said to go through the war of 48 and 67, to lose a child in, in Yom Kippur, only to have my grandkids having to wear gas masks. He was furious about it. And I think I'm so happy that he's not alive today. I'm so happy after October 7, my dad called me and he said, you know, this is the first time I'm happy that my mother passed away two years ago. And he said, this is the first time that I'm truly happy that she's not here. Mm -hmm. So when I think about people moving out of Israel, I feel I owe it to my grandfather, I owe it to my mother to, to stay and try to create something better than what we have right now. But as a mother of a two-year-old baby, knowing that 16 years from now, or you know, my seven-year-old, he just had a birthday and he loves camping. And he, every year we go camping on his birthday and we're not going camping right now. Mm. And I feel that as a mother, I owe it to my kids to try to do whatever I can so that by the time they're 18, this will be a country worth living in and living for, not just a country worth dying for. Mm -hmm. But you can hear many Israelis struggling with this question right now. Right. I'm getting the signal that we're almost over. I just want to ask one last question because I want to end on somewhat of a hopeful note if you can share that at all because obviously what you're saying you know, really resonates and it's a struggle that you know, we're hearing and, and appreciating and, and sympathizing with in Israel. But we also hear a lot about resilience of Israelis, of the Jewish people. We know that over Jewish history, the Jews have been resilient. What are you seeing, both in your personal experience, in your practice? What hope can you share with us that this will, you know, that this we will overcome this? We will, we will be resilient. I have 
a whole lot of hope in that. I think before October 7th, I have to say the, the, the month of the, the protest against the, the legal coup, I saw the, the Israeli society waking up and it was so beautiful. And it was such a time of, of real hope and, and solidarity. And also right now, I, I think, I will give you an example. I live in a, in a neighborhood in, a, in Tel Aviv, and I was, when I was going to, to fly over to Eilat uh, with the hospital delegation, I knew that I need um, bubbles, uh, because one of the things you do with anxiety with kids is, I don't know how you call it in English, I'll say what, when you make yeah, bubbles? Bubbles, like yeah, mm -hmm. blow bubbles. So I wanted to bring bubbles with me to Eilat, but I was working really late in the hospital and I didn't have time to, to go because I knew the shop closes. And I texted in the WhatsApp, in the, like the neighborhood's WhatsApp uh, group, and I said, listen, I'm, I'm flying over, I don't have time to get to the shop. If everyone's near the shop, please buy something and, and I'll, I'll pay you back. And by the time I got home from the hospital, our yard, front yard, was boxes over boxes <laughs> over, and no, they didn't leave a note. I don't know who it was, but somebody bought the entire shop, the, literally the entire shop, and I couldn't carry all of it <laughs> with me in the, in the suitcase. You saw people giving everything, people opening their houses in our neighborhood. I mean, p families hosting other families, people flying down, people going up, people, people from the north. It was, and it still is so beautiful. And it made me so proud of being Israeli. It reminded me, I was backpacking in India and an Israeli that I don't know uh, came to me and said, that another Israeli fell from a canoe in a village and that they're making a search delegation. So I said, okay, let's go. And then there was this French guy sitting next to me and he said, what? You don't know this guy? And I said, yeah. He said, you're telling me that all the Israelis are going now to search for some Israeli that fell off a canoe? And I said, yeah. He said, if a French guy would fall from a canoe in a, in a different village, I wouldn't be going there to... to <laughs> And they said, yeah, that's, I think this is something about the, the Jewish culture mm -hmm. that I'm very proud of. It. And, and I think this is resilience. Right. Well, the image of the canoe and the bubble boxes are ones that I think we really appreciate you sharing with us. I'm about to introduce our last, um, our last closing speaker, but I do uh, want to do one thing that I always do at the end of our One Book, One Hadassah, and that is announce our next One Book selection. And in fact, we have the author of our next book with us tonight, I think she was supposed to be here, Rosa Lowinger, who wrote a book called Dwell Time, a memoir of art, exile, and repair. So this is a story about a Rosa whose family escaped to Miami from Cuba after Castro's revolution. It weaves her personal story with her decades of conservation experience, paralleling her work on art repair with healing generational trauma. It's a book that, again, I know you're going to enjoy. We only pick good books. And that's on April 18th. Um, back on Zoom only, we will be thinking about a new, another in person. In fact, we'll be doing one in July in Las Vegas at a Hadassah convention, Hadassah assembly meetings. But for now, we're back on Zoom at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So Ayala, I really want to thank you. And now I want to introduce someone who will thank you again, and that is Ellen Hirschkin. Ellen Hirschkin really needs no introduction, certainly to the Dasa crowd, because she's a former national president. She most recently served as chair of the travel program, and now she has joined the Hadassah Magazine family to become the chair of Hadassah Magazine. So in that capacity, I'm so delighted to ask you to close our program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa and Ayelet for a most informative, entertaining, and thought-provoking session. Do you agree? As an American with Israeli friends, both in Israel and in the United States, I realized that I cannot presume to fully understand the differences in the way anti-Semitism manifests itself against Jews in general and Israelis in particular. 
I know the wolf hunt will motivate us to engage in conversations, placing the topic front and center, reflecting on its content and impact, depending on one's personal background. Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America, is proud to bring such a program to fruition. And now for an update on other activities. On October 7th, some of the most horrific violence imaginable occurred, including heinous acts of gender-based sexual violence committed by Hamas, primarily against women and girls. These shocking atrocities were planned, filmed, shared, and celebrated to terrorize and humiliate. Since Hadassah's founding, in 1912, we have stood side by side in support of Israel and her people. Now is the time to speak out for these victims. Hadassah has launched our End the Silence global campaign to bring awareness of the weaponization of sexual violence in times of war. We are calling on the United Nations to pursue an unbiased investigation into these crimes and seek justice for the injured parties in Israel and beyond. Hadassah Medical Organization's trained professionals at the Bat Ami Center for Victims of Sexual Abuse help patients begin the healing process. They offer support and counseling to those who are suffering the effects of PTSD and trauma-related mental health issues, as well as the physical aftermath of their attackers. Hadassah's hospitals are caring for many of the most severely wounded IDF soldiers and civilians who need complex specialized treatment provided by medical personnel with expertise in crisis medicine and trauma-informed care. HMO's role is increasingly in demand for the thousands who need our medical expertise. In addition, our youth Aliyah villages have sadly faced the loss of young men killed in Gaza. Nayarim lost three alumni and the son of a couple who work and live in the village. And we learned earlier this week that a Meishfeya graduate was also killed in Gaza. The need for psychological therapies for our students and staff is critically important. The support needed connects our Youth Aliyah project to HMO, which is responsibly answering the call. We are also meeting the requirements set by Israel's homeland security by building additional shelters. Your gift to Hadassah now could not be more effective. Given the emergency crisis since October 7th, your gift provides Hadassah with the flexibility to apply support to what is needed most in real time as the situation evolves. Donations, no matter the size, contribute to saving countless lives and alleviating the suffering of those caught in the crossfire. Every dollar counts to purchase the medical supplies, essential equipment, other indispensable devices and services to meet emerging and shifting needs. There are pledge cards and pens underneath each seat. As you exit the auditorium, you'll see people on hand to collect your generous gifts. For viewers at home, please go to go.hadassah.org slash donate live. And there is a link in the chat box. If you're not already a member, we invite you to become part of our community of like-minded women and supporters. Add your voice to the 300,000 strong to effect change, support one another, and Israel. Receive invitations to exciting upcoming programs like this one. Membership is just $36 a year or $250 for life membership, which includes many benefits, such as a subscription to our award-winning Hadassah magazine. Go to hadassah.org slash 
join. We thank Hadassah Southern California for its incredible partnership, especially Sandy Sadikoff, Audrey Levine, Lauren Rothman and her staff. We also owe many thanks to the staff of Hadassah Magazine, especially Leah Finkelstein and Ariel Kaplan, as well as Stephen Frank, Maureen Mandel, Ellie Hirschko of Hadassah's Engagement, of Engagement and Marcom Divisions, and of course, Alex Friedman, Norm Cherubino, and Erica Brody for their role in bringing this first, hopefully not the last, but this first in-person One Book, One Hadassah. Thank you, those of you who are here at AJU and those on Zoom, hundreds of our loyal One Book, One Hadassah participants, as well as new viewers. So please, you heard it before, please consider joining Rhoda Smalo and me as we lead the second One Hadassah Solidarity Mission to Israel, March 17th through the 22nd. There's nothing like bearing witness in our homeland. It'll be the trip of a lifetime. It will be an experience you will never forget. So now, I invite everyone, everyone here, sorry, sorry about those of you at home, go to the kitchen. I now invite everyone here to a special dessert reception where Ayelet's book will be available for purchase and she will proudly sign yours. For those watching from home, a link to buy Ayelet's book is posted in the, in the chat and it gives me great pleasure to say Shalom, Erev Tov, Todaraba. בקרוב תזרח השמש, נדע ימים יפים מאלה, הלב נלחם בדאגות. כולם יחזרו הביתה, נחכה להם למטה, הלוואי נדע בשורות טובות. כי עם הנצח לעולם לא מפחד, אפילו כשקשה לי...